So, Michelle. Oh, hi. What have we learnt in the last week? For me, never cross a comedian. Right, just don't cross comedians. <laughs> I know, this comedian has really turned it into being, you know, someone you just don't cross. You, you do not. Look, let's put it this way. Comedians have a very, very very specific mindset. In fact, one of the psychologists, when I was working for ASIO, yep. said she could write a thesis on me because she said there is a certain manic depression I know. and low self-esteem that all comedians must have to be able to stand up in front of a room of complete strangers and go, shut up and listen to me because what I'm about to say is funnier than anything you can think of. Right, that's got to have a real sense of low self-esteem that you need that kind of approval, yep. but also that incredible sense of courage to get up there and do it. Absolutely. And when you make that person the leader of a country that's being invaded by a much bigger country, well, you know, good luck. Yeah, of course, we're talking about Vladimir Zelensky, uh, Ukrainian's current president. Yeah. And he really has become a bit of a social media icon. But social media is really ruling this war at the moment. It really it, is. We'll tap into that a little bit because we're going to talk about something. I really want to talk about what Zelensky did last night when he welcomed the foreign fighters that are now beginning to flow into the Ukraine. And I thought, well, we both thought. This is the perfect time to talk about this because it's an issue that comes up quite often in Australia. Particularly around war, so let's yeah, get well, in. definitely. You're listening to I Spy, the freedom fighter of Australian intelligence. So let me just get, do I, which way do I point this? No, 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 turn it around, turn oh, it around, turn oh, around, oh, around, right, now, around. Oh. No, not at me, not at oh, me. Oh, oh, No, at the enemy. Oh, enemy. Whoa, whoa. which one? Just stop. Oh, put the it guy down. in the tank that's put run it out down. of petrol. Put it down, put it down. You want a lift? Hello and welcome to I Spy. My name is Michelle Stevenson and I'm here with David Callan. And this ep, we're going to tackle um, freedom fighters, particularly because this has been a conversation in terms of the Ukraine-Russian war. And there's some complexities around whether they're allowed to go over and fight and whether they're going to be welcomed back home. So there's a lot to tap in. But before yeah. we kind of get into that... Yep. We, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't really touch on what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. And a brief overview, I suspect, is warranted at this point before we kind of dig a little deeper into this whole idea of freedom fighters. Okay, Ukraine in 25 words or less? Go. All right. give, give me the elevator pitch. Okay, the elevator pitch. <laughs> um, Vladimir went to war. So Putin went to war. Yeah. Overestimating his ability and underestimating the ability of the enemy. Correct. Right. He thought he was going to walk in there. Ukraine would go, oh, Vlad. And <laughs> Ukraine went, oh, Vlad. Enjoy a Molotov cocktail. Yes. Right? I think there was a serious underestimation that went yes. on here. And the problem is he can't pull out without losing face. No. And what's really interesting too is we're hearing multiple stories of Russian soldiers not being told where they were actually even going mm -hmm. and showing up to Ukraine. And they were under the impression that they'd be welcome with open arms because, you know, the Ukrainians were oppressed and they needed to be freed. Yep. And then, you know, the Russians walk in there with their tanks and the Ukrainian people are just standing there without weapons, just going, go home, we don't want yep. you here. And and they're just really gone, I don't know what to do now. Now, we're hearing reports that Russian fighters are actually- They're, they're spiking their they're fuel spiking, tanks. They're, they're all these things because they don't want to fight. They don't want to fight. I mean, there's reports that the soldiers haven't seen food in three or four days. They can't yes. get petrol. They're being towed back over the border by farmers with tractors. Yes. I, I love the video of people stealing the, the tanks. And just to me, it's like, this is gold. Yeah. And my favourite thing too is um, the Ukrainian da tax department putting out that whole thing about how you can claim- how you can yep. claim a Russian tank if you get one. No, you don't have to claim it as income. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you, if you wind up with a Russian tank, you don't have to claim it. But as I said on the Twitter feed, at I Spy Podcast, yeah. uh, when I said yeah, basically, but do I get to depreciate it and then you know, write claim that off back. on my yeah. tax return. Now, the other thing that's really interesting is the amount that social media is influencing this in that, I mean, there was a really interesting point and it comes down to the fact that Intelligence right now, the intelligence mm. world is absolutely yes. popping because with some of the results that are happening in the Ukraine, there's more than likely somebody in the Kremlin that's feeding information out to the West. And one of the examples they cite was a group of Chechen mercenaries who were mm. sent in by Putin to assassinate Zelensky or at least capture him. And they made a video as they crossed the border going, we're coming to get 
picture. Yeah. And then within 24 hours, that entire column was destroyed. Yes. And, you know, what What a lot of this is about is the social media aspect. And yeah. everyone thought that Putin had this wrapped up. But what we've heard is the Biden administration actually has some pretty amazing cyber intelligence going on. And they were able to really get in early and yeah. put, put a stop to Putin selling this from his perspective. Well, with the Chechens as well, this yep. group of Chechens that then got wiped out, a lot of people said, so one side of the argument is, well, somebody in the Kremlin told the Ukrainians the Chechens were coming. Yep. But as somebody pointed out, when you look at the video, whoever shot the video did not switch the geolocation on oh. their phone off. And the Chechens would have literally, their cyber group would have gone, they're there. Yes. Fire. And interestingly, um, we've seen instances, speaking of geolocation, you know, of Google and Google Maps and Apple turning off the ability to go into Apple Maps because yeah. you can then see where people are. So, look, there's all kinds of things. We really want to get into this whole war, but it is fast moving and free flowing. And I think whatever we say today will be irrelevant on by the time by the time time it it comes out yeah Yeah. so i think what we're going to do is we're going to leave it for a little bit wait till it builds to that crescendo which we are kind of seeing at the moment Mm. and then you know i think our listeners will be better served if we give analysis now the thing is let's go to the the foreign fighters yes because i think this is this was something that i was really passionate about because there's a lot of confusion around this and what's really interesting is with iraq and those countries our leaders were very adamant that you weren't mm-hmm. allowed to go over there and fight, but you know it's a little bit murkier with well, the Ukraine Russia war. Going back right back to the beginning, what happened was, I think it's something like twenty people have approached the Ukrainian embassy for yep. visas to travel to the Ukraine to fight. Yeah, right. And the Ukrainian embassy doing the right thing turned around to the Australian government and went, oh, "There's twenty of you guys who want to come across." Yeah. Right. Now. Interestingly enough, and I have, I've dug around the legislation, and when Scott Morrison said, look, we've got to check the legislation on this, he's not wrong because it's very complicated because if you look at the legislation that they put in place for Syria, yep. for the people that were going over and fighting for ISIS, for the people that were going over to Afghanistan, and essentially what that that is, you're not fighting for a nation, you're fighting for a non-government organisation. Right. You're fighting for a terrorist group. Yes. Right, so that makes it really quite crystal clear as to what's going on. But when you look at the Ukraine, Essentially, the Ukraine have said, if you want to come over here and fight, we will create a foreign legion that you can join. So, And there is actually nothing in the law yeah. stopping you from going to another country and if they're willing to sign you up to their military, you can do that. Yeah, and what was really interesting was not that long ago our foreign minister, Maurice Payne, kind of said, you know, if you go over, you when you come back, you will be charged. Like it was – they were very – the government was very adamant that the rules on this were you can't go over. Yeah. And that started to somewhat change and I don't know when it did. I My, my theory is the UK, basically British veterans were taking time off work yeah. to now go to Ukraine and help them fight. Well, they, the British government have turned around and said to anyone who is currently serving in the military or in the military reserve, you can't go. Don't well, do it. they, they, yeah, so the U, it's interesting. So the UK, some of the um, ministers are saying, yes, go and fight. Mm-hmm. And then some of them are saying, you could face arrest on your return and you could be charged with counter terrorism offences. It all comes down to this thing of they're on our side. I yeah. think it really comes down to that because let's go back. Here's the thing is this is not a new thing in Australia and even the whole Syria and the Afghanistan thing, still not new. Yeah. When Yugoslavia broke up, I remember I had schoolmates because mm. I was about 19, 20, yep. I think, when Yugoslavia collapsed. No, a bit older, but it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> so we know you're old. <laughs> yeah, I'm old. All right, I was, I was an adult, but a young <laughs> one. Right, so what happens, Yugoslavia broke up and then suddenly a whole bunch of my mates mm. who were either Serbian or Croatian in their descent mm. just disappeared. For six months, they disappeared, and then they reappeared, and they were not happy campers. Oh. They, they'd gone, right, we're going to go home and fight for the motherland, and they went back for six months and fought for the motherland and then got the hell out of there when they went, this isn't what we thought mm. it was. They, mm. they they were young guys. They were very passionate, and they went, we're going to go over there and fight. And then when they got back, they were, you, know, you said, what happened? It's like they did not want to talk about yes. it. Yes. Now, look, and the Australians are saying, basically, if you have no military experience, do not go over over there and do a one-week course because there are there are Ukrainians that are, they want to do this. Yep. They're saying even like the 
the Ukraine ambassador saying, don't do this because you will end up as cannon fodder. You, you go, you're going to have no experience. You're going to be standing in front of a Russian tank with like one week training uh, on military grade yeah. weapons and it's not going to end well. But uh, what they- Essentially, you are what is called in the acting profession as a soft prop. <laughs> yeah. That's all you basically, are. Basically, basically. But-, but they are saying, you know, if you have military experience, we will welcome you. Yeah. Uh, and we will sign you into our military and treat you as a foreign legionnaire, yeah. for want of a better phrase. Yeah. Now, even going back further, when you go back to the 60s, when there was like the Astashi, I think we talked about it in our episode, he's not that into Yugoslavia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have a listen. Fun to, I know. Where I think it was Astashi sent about 30 guys over to Yugoslavia, where they were then either captured or killed. Yeah. Right? The thing about going over to a foreign country and fighting for them is- it's really dangerous. But the thing with Syria, and I, I want to look at David Hicks and Mamdou Habib, who were the two guys who went to Afghanistan. Mamdou Habib was kidnapped in Pakistan. Mm. He was meant to have been in contact with Al-Qaeda. Yep. Um, David Hicks was captured in Afghanistan yes. fighting with Al-Qaeda. Yep. Both of them wound up in Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. Right. Interestingly enough, David Hicks, who had very short hair, very sort of like strident, he had extreme views. He wound, came out with very long hair and when asked, you know, what's with the long hair, he grew it long because they kept playing with the lights. You know, there there is the torture that went on. There was, a, what do they call them? Uh, interrogation techniques. We could talk about Russians and files, but we won't. No, um, <laughs> no, my teeth just really yeah. didn't stop. Yeah, they stop. just start vibrating. <laughs> right, so enhanced interrogation yes, techniques. That's yes. what I was thinking of. Right, so the thing like is- Like waterboarding. Yeah, well, Mamdu Habib reportedly was taken from Pakistan, where he'd been tortured, to uh, he was rendered to a black site in Egypt, where he was tortured, then rendered to another black site where he was tortured and finally wound up in Guantanamo Bay. I'm, where he was tortured. Where he was, you know. He, enhanced. Yeah, enha- he was interrogated in an enhanced Hunched way. way. Right. Now, I had the good fortune to meet his wife and children. Wow. Peter Butt, friend of the podcast, who helped us with the script of episode. Mm. Peter wanted to do a documentary about Mamdu Habib. Yep. And we filmed a bit of footage where we interviewed his family. Really fascinating to go in because mm. you, you go into the house. We had to wait in the backyard for about 20 minutes while her son, Mamdu's son, mm. came home because his mother was alone. Right. right. And it was like, you do not go into the house. It's a, you know, they're a very Islamic family. You don't yep. go into the house. But, you know, this was a normal Western suburbs kid. Like, yeah. Nice. Yep. Actually, yep. lovely bloke. Yeah. The entire family was really nice. Her thing was like, you know, my husband's made a mistake, but does he deserve to be locked away no. in perpetuity? Now, he's been released. David Hicks has been released. What's interesting about this is they got home. The big fear that we always have is these returned fighters are then going to keep fighting when they get here. Yes, both, right. Both Hicks and Mandu Habib have basically gone, no. No, thanks. I'm out. Yeah, and look, I understand that from a terrorism perspective because mm. there is this idea that what if they come here and they become this lone wolf terrorism and they take they bring these ideals. But I do think that this is a different kind of war. Most definitely. Most definitely. Yeah. And also the threat of it is actually reduced if they've seen combat. There yeah. was a, a, interestingly enough, they were talking about how in France they'd had a spate of terrorists, you know, the Charlie Hebdo. They, these guys, the guy that did the Je suis Charlie yeah. um, attacks, the guy who drove his car down the Corniche in Nice and mm. all that sort of stuff. These guys were all people that had gone to either Syria or to Afghanistan to train as fighters. Yeah. But they'd never actually seen any combat. And a psychologist in the US studied this mm. and he was looking at right-wing extremism in the US. And, of course, in a lot of right-wing extremist groups, you get ex-servicemen. Yeah. Funnily enough, most of the ex-servicemen in these right-wing extremist groups are not the guys that served on the line. You know, if you're kicking down doors in Fallujah, the last thing you want to do is do that when you go home. Yeah. But if you're working in the carpool in the green zone at Baghdad, you may want some action, and if you can't get it in the combat zone, you'll bring it home. You might look for it at home, yeah. and that's where the risk entails. Yeah, and I think what the issue is here too is the legality of those people travelling from Australia to Ukraine. Like even Scott Morrison, Prime Minister, mm-hmm. said, you know, this is all really unclear. We've got law experts who say that the criminal code to make it an offence for citizens or residents to become foreign fighters is also a little bit unclear because you can yeah. have an exemption. So under the criminal 
Penal Code, a ministerial declaration can be issued in cases where it's in interests of the defence or international relations of Australia to permit the service of a person to join a specific armed force in a foreign country. You did a lot of reading then. Well, no. well You had to go through the legislation. I, yeah, because yeah. the legislation is – it's really, really fascinating because whenever we've spoken about Australians going over to fight in foreign wars, it's been hands down that is not acceptable. They've been joining terrorist groups. Yeah. I mean, they've been joining like ISIS. The whole thing with ISIS was guys were going over there and uh, the worst thing is the women that went over. Yeah. The women that have married ISIS fighters and gone over to Syria and then one found themselves in a medieval culture. They've, yeah. they've really gone backwards culturally. But also they've had children. Their husbands have been killed. Yeah. They're stuck in Syria and the Australian government have turned around and gone, sorry, you're supporting a terrorist organisation. Yeah. You can't come home. Which I understand. It's like it's a, there's a lot of stickiness in the situation mm. and, you know, law experts say, as you quite rightly pointed out as well, that governments would be reluctant to give anyone who fights in these foreign instances a free pass because they're worried that they might be energised to continue that pursuit of military-style tactics back here. Yeah. Now, there's... There is a really interesting case about somebody who uh, went to Indonesia. Yeah. Right? A guy who went to Indonesia, met Jamar Islamia while he was there, the terrorist group over there, and yep. then wound up back in Sydney where he joined Jamar Islamia in Sydney. Yes, we do have members of Jamar Islamia and all pretty much every terrorist group you can think of probably running around the country, and they're being watched, we hope. Now, the thing is this guy had been tasked. He then went to Afghanistan and he met Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Mm -hmm. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed introduced him to the big guy, Osama bin Laden. Right. Where he was tasked to come back to Australia and attack Israeli assets. Now, that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. And he travelled to Canberra and he filmed the Israeli embassy, borrowed a camera off a, a Jamar Islamia member in Sydney. Then he quite literally went, mm. this is wrong. I can't do this. Yeah. And he rang ASIO. And there was a little bit of a problem because, and this is all hearsay, I will say that right now, I believe the ASIO is an exceptionally professional organisation and I don't believe the organisation itself did anything wrong. I okay. think a member of that organisation or a for, now a former member of that organisation may have made a little bit of a mistake when he booked to interview this guy, to meet with him and talk to him. Mm. But he also had tickets to Sexpo and he was going to meet this porn star he really liked. Um, <laughs> is this you? No, no, oh. no, 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 no. I was long gone by then. You got you to have this look on your face like. <laughs> no, I, I got that look on my face because when I heard this story, yeah. and it, again, it was someone went, well, this could have happened. Yeah. I just sat there going, excuse me while I put my jaw back in. Yeah. Because it was like, are you serious that that happened? Now, interestingly enough, it took three phone calls for this man. His name is Jack Roach. Mm. It took three phone calls for him to get in contact, finally get someone to listen to him. Right. And now he, to this day, he wound up in prison. He went to prison. He's the, the maximum sentence is, I think, nine and a half years. He yeah. served four and a half because he basically went, I, I don't want to do this. Mm. And this is one of the things we find with a lot of these people that are tasked. They go overseas, they get G'd up. They, oh, yeah, I'm going to kill. I'm going to kill for the cause. They come back and then they look at the look around and go, why am I doing this? Yeah. Right. He went through that epiphany where he went, this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing it. He tried to contact ASIO, but he, he got fobbed off by a guy who just, it was a personal screw up. Sex bug. Sex bug. Well, you know. <laughs> she was very pretty, I understand. Um, he had his own he had, he, he had his own honey trap going on. What? <laughs> he'd, he set, he'd set his own honey trap. He reversed honey trap himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's the worst case. Like, it's masturbation as a honey trap, which is just wrong. I know. Uh, ew, <laughs> uh, I've just, my hair, it's all want, sticky. It's a sticky kind of honey trap. You don't, don't want that honey trap. I don't want to touch anything. <laughs> right. So anyway, Jack Roach to this day maintains mm. the belief that if he'd gotten to ASIO sooner or ASIO had gotten to him sooner, 9-11 could have been prevented. The Bali bombing could have been prevented. Really? Because he basically said, look, these guys are planning stuff and wow. you need to know. Wow. Now, whether well, that's a major fuck-up, isn't it, a, really? Yeah, but it's a major fuck-up on one guy, Ugh. right, which, which again comes down yeah. to that whole idea. And, again, this is all hearsay. It could be absolutely wrong, right? Yeah. But the fact that it took three times for this guy to get in contact mm. and when he got through, there the problem had already occurred. Yes. Right? So 9-11 had occurred. Bali bombing had occurred. I don't know the actual timeline of his contact because he could be saying that to to try and assuage yep. his own difficulties. But the bottom line is, you know, these people come home yep. with plans. Yep. They're not always followed through. Yeah. And I don't look, I don't think it's anything we need to worry about in this instance. I think it's no. because what we're seeing here too is like 
most Russian expats here don't like what's going on. <laughs> like we, there's instances in Australia where Russians are setting fire to their own passports. They're really, yeah. they're actually not, they're looking on this and from a from a Western perspective and an understanding because they're not in Russia and they're not being fed Russian um, communications and yeah. pr- propaganda. They have an understanding that what is going on is wrong. But what we did see recently was the Russian embassy had to be evacuated because there was a su- suspicious package on the door. <laughs> Step. Look, it wasn't anything, but you know, so I they think- just went across the road to the Kingston Hotel, had a steak lunch, and then went back. Yeah, and it was all over. <laughs> yeah, it was all over. And ASIO just photographed everybody as they walked past. But yep. yeah, but I do think that's kind of the extent of what we'll see. I don't think I don't think there's many people here who would blame Russians here. I think no. I I, 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 totally I think agree with I think that. it's very clear that this is Putin. Yeah. and just one man. This is not the people. It's Putin and Lushenko and the enablers around. Yes, him, all right. And yes. the uh, I mean, interestingly enough, even the big risk everyone was worried about was, mm. oh, my God, if if Putin goes into Ukraine, China will go into Taiwan. And I think Xi Jinping, and the great rumour that came out was he turned around, Xi Jinping turned around to Putin at the Olympics and went, wait until after the closing ceremony. I please. know. And then I know I did a really funny meme of China, you know, that Homer Simpson thing where he disappears back this, into the hedge. I'm like, this is China right now. Yeah, China. yeah, yeah. They're like, but oh, we're not doing anything. That's because he's seen, yeah. like, the, the fact that they brought Swift in on board, yes. the fact that the petrochemical industry are all pulling out of Russia. Yeah. Well, when they pull out of Russia, it's very interesting. Somebody, there was one energy group basically pulled out. Went, We're yeah. not going to invest in any more Russian development. Yes. It's like, yeah, but what about all the investments you've already got in place? Yeah. So there is that. But I think China is currently going, yeah, if we go into Taiwan, we're going to get hit with that same stick. And it's a big stick to be yeah. hit with. But like getting back to the the whole fighting thing, what was really interesting too is we saw countries go from providing soft aid to lethal aid. Well, that was us. Yeah, that was us. Well, a lot of the other countries. So they'll get well, that in we, about twenty forty, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> well, we kind of followed a lot of other countries because that they kind of turned around and said, "Look, we're not going to give you boots on the ground. We're not going to fight this war, yeah. but we will help you, and so we will give you what you need to fight the war." Because you know, Zelensky said that thing where he goes, "I don't need a lift out of here. I need." ammunition and yeah. guns. And I mean, that's a, that, that's a really interesting point that you've made there. No one's putting boots on the ground here. No. Right? It, it is, and he said, we, we, we will welcome any foreign fighter that comes in. Yes. We'll give you a gun and we'll point you in the direction of the front. That's fine. But interestingly enough, I think the caginess in the response, particularly with the sanctions, particularly with the armaments, yeah. is I thought everyone was waiting for World War Three online to begin. Yeah, and it hasn't wait- really happened. It hasn't really happened. And I think, I really do think that it's an overestimation on Putin's Yes. Yeah, because what people were expecting was that he would shut down the electricity systems and he hasn't done that. So also, you know, back onto the Freedom Fighters stuff, you know, 150 former paratroopers who served in Afghanistan, UK paratroopers, are now on their way to fight on the front line with Ukraine, ex-Special Forces soldiers, thousands of others from around the world. This is going to be very interesting to see how this is handled by specific governments upon their return. There's that. And it's also, it's going to be very interesting to see how they actually mesh themselves into the Ukrainian Defence Force as well because they're going yeah. to come in with different tactics, different like they, they'll be used. They'd be used to different equipment. That's really neither here nor there. Despite the fact that there are differences between an AK forty seven and say a Steyr or a, mm. an M sixteen. Yeah. A gun's a gun's a gun. You know, you yeah. point it in the right direction, you pull the trigger, it's going to get the same result eventually. So there is the big thing will be the repatriation of them. Yeah. And then once they're home, you know. We have problems with our own vets. Yeah. Right. Now, if we're dealing with people that have gone out and done, like, essentially what is private contracting for another government, are we going to deal with the PTSD or are the Ukrainians going to deal with the PTSD? Exactly. Because there will be trauma involved. And, of course, they'll be coming home injured and there will be people killed. That is the – honestly, that's when the the rubber hits the road. The first Mm. time a body comes home – that's when it's really going to sink home that this is not a game, kids. This yeah. is bad. So now we've got we've got Asia who are keeping their eyes on who's leaving and yep. what's going on yep. and whether they're ex-military or whatever. And I think what would be the main thing of concern right now? What would Asia be looking for? Would it be some stuff happening here in our backyard, like any kind of pro-Russian rhetoric, or would it be caution around people leaving to fight? I think Asia's main focus right now would be cold war tactics against the Russians themselves. They'd be looking at the Russian embassy very, very closely. And also, I mean, the thing is, if there is dissension in the ranks, Mm. I mean, the the classic was – 
Putin getting up and saying, you know, this is what we're going to do. We're going to invade Ukraine and, you know, it's a fait accompli and these are my reasons and we've, it should always be ours. Yeah. And then he turned around to every one of his ministers and said, do you agree? And I went, yeah, 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 whatever, boss. And then his intelligence chief turned around and went, well, technically you're right, but. And as mm. soon as he did that, on national television, yeah. Putin ripped him to pieces. Now, doing that is a huge problem because now you've got an intelligence chief that's gone, you don't want to hear your intelligence. Then yeah, I'm not going to give it to you. Yeah, right. So you've got dissension in the ranks now. Well, because be- Put- yeah, Putin is used to being told what he wants to hear. He's surrounded by sycophants, yeah, and that, yeah. as soon as you're surrounded by sycophants, you're not getting the information you yeah. need. You're getting what you want, and that's not a good way to be. So would the intelligence? It would be massively shared at this point, right? There would be a lot of intel sharing going on. Yes. Which, like Five Eyes, uh, I bumped into someone walking into the studio and we were talking <laughs> about this very issue and he yeah. just turned around and said, my God, Five Eyes actually seem to know what they're doing in right. this Right, okay. I mean, you've got the problems like the, the, the people that are hanging back. You've got Pakistan, which is – Voted for Russia, but it's then, re- yeah, that's odd. But I they're, think they're doing just- a deal with them at the moment. Yeah, India have bought weapons off uh, Russia, but have also gone. Well, we're going to abstain. We're going to stay mm. back. We're going to hold back. Yep. China as well. I think China have literally gone. You know, let's see what happens in five years, which is the way China thinks. I know. It looks at it in generational terms, yeah. not what's going to happen in the next five 100%. minutes. One hundred percent. And I think Xi Jinping is actually going. If we go, if we side hard with the Russians. That's all we're going to have to trade with. Mm. And at the moment, their economy is rocky and Xi Jinping is about to go into an election, um, despite the fact that he's- I was going to say he's already won. <laughs> yeah, but it's- And when we say election, we we put our quotes around air quotes, that. Air yeah. quotes. But uh, the, re- the the response from the, the country is still important. And you know yeah. what? There have been revolutions there before. So- it, there could be somebody else in the background that's just got his finger on the pulse yes. slightly better than Xi Jinping. I wouldn't imagine it. But also, he can't afford his economy to tank if the world goes, oh, you're supporting sanctions. Putin. Yeah. Okay, we're going to start you with sanctions yeah. too. Look, there's a, the sanction business, I think, is where this war is being fought. But interestingly, I think I think there's a lot to unpack in terms of Ukraine and Russia, and we'll keep our we'll keep our eyes on it over the next few apps. And oh, hot, definitely. And there will be some deep analysis this we'll probably get a guest on because I mean we don't we can only interpret what we read we so only be, get what we see yeah. yeah so it'd be good to get someone who actually um, knows what they're talking about <laughs> hey yeah good point. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> and but the freedom fighter issue I think is also a really interesting one to keep across I think it'll be I mean, we've already noticed that the government has changed their tune on that. It's a low simmer. To me, if you look at the the stovetop of global politics right now, or (laughs) like the Ukraine situation, the foreign fighters, people going over there to fight, that's a low simmer on the back burner. Yeah. But I think it could be something that could be a problem. I just don't see it becoming a terrorist issue. I see it becoming a repatriation and a veterans affairs issue more than that. Yeah. In that these guys are going to come back damaged. Yeah. And let's hope that you're not using gas on your stovetop because Russia controls it. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, that's a great thing for us. I mean, if Europe doesn't get their gas from somewhere, we've got quite a bit of it down here. Yeah, if you want it. hey guys. Although we've pretty much already sold it to everyone else. Yeah, we sold it to Japan, who sell it back to us at a premium. Yeah, it makes yeah. so much sense. We really didn't think that through. Did we? <laughs> like, like most things, our government has not thought through. Next time, just think that deal through. Don't lock the price in for twenty years. That's dumb. So yeah, look, foreign fighters, guys. Bottom line, don't go. Yeah. Don't go. No. But, you know, I understand that there's a lot of Ukrainians who are passionate about helping out, but I think the issue is I think what the government is most concerned about is Ukrainians who have no military experience going yeah. over thinking that they can help. Yeah. And and even they're being told, look, you're just going to turn into cannon fodder. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just stay home. Yeah. Watch some TV. Watch some telly. You know what? Send some money. Yeah. Send money. Send money. Or maybe, you know, just um, do what all the states have done and turn their buildings in the colours of Ukraine because virtue signalling is the way to win a war. Well, you never know. And also, send a bag of bullets. Why not? <laughs> they need ammo. Yeah. <laughs> a bag of bullets. They come in bags, don't they? I do. <laughs> Someone's shot a gun before. Looking for a new career? 
Welcome to Do HVAC Training Service Center in North Charleston. Enroll today in our comprehensive HVAC training hands-on field experience based program covering troubleshooting, maintenance, installation, and more on various HVAC systems and ductwork. We offer EPA and NAIT preparation and testing along with various certifications. Enjoy payment options. Achieve certification in under five months. Enroll now for your new journey of skill development and career advancement. Log on to DEWHVACTrainingSC.com to inquire. 